Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, founder of The Complete Herbal Guide. Today, I'm very excited because we have our special guest today, and his name is Mark Sharp. He is a psychologist, and he talk, he helps people with relationships. But before we go into our little conversation with Mark, I just want to talk really briefly about a sponsor for that is sponsoring our uh, podcast today. It is Resync, and they have some great products out right now, and one of them is is Resync Recovery. Resync Recovery supports blood flow and circulation. It's the number one nitric oxide booster taken by professional athletes. It helps address inflammation and positively impacts the inflammatory markers. And it also helps you recover energy. And another product that I wanted to talk about was Resync's collagen peptides. Resync, Resync collagen peptides support the circulation and, and strengthens every layer of the body. It contains ingredients such as vitamin C and mineral copper to, to build collagen. And it reduces some muscle soreness and supports joint mobility and comfort. So thank you very much, um, Resync, for sponsoring this podcast. And you can find Resync at resyncproducts.com. So Mark, why don't you tell me a little about yourself and what you do? Because I know that our listeners are very anxious to um, talk about uh, everything. Okay, you... well, um, I'm a psychologist, like you said, and I focus on working on relationships. Um, for the last 16 years, I just, I've had a private practice that has focused on that. And I work prim primarily with couples um, or um, you know, every once in a while I get a member of a couple whose partner doesn't want to be involved and I will do that even though it's not ideal. But I also do some stuff for singles who are kind of interested in, um, in building relationship skills and kind of finding, finding their own relationship. Um, I've got a couple of books. Well, no, I've got one book and then one in process. So I'm counting it already. So I guess I should <laughs> do that, right? No, um, it's actually very good to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first is, is it's actually a book for, um, for singles and it's kind of really sort of, how do you examine yourself and prepare yourself and make sure you're the, the, the majority of the books about that, right? Make sure mm -hmm. you're in the best place to, to be ready for a relationship. And then there's a little bit about, there's a little bit about sort of how's the best way to kind of go through the process of finding somebody. Um, and then the other book is, it's, this is really a dull title, so it's a working title. I'm working for something better, right? But it's it's a consumer guide for relationship counseling because okay. people who um, traditional psychological theories don't work particularly well with relationships because they're very individually focused. And if you come in and do therapy um, with the idea of fixing everybody's pathology, you usually make things worse rather than help people figure out how to manage their stuff with each other. So that's, that book is kind of about that process for people. So that's, um, that's, oh, let's see. I'm, I'm married, have two great dogs and there we go. <laughs> now I have an audience. I have a large audience that is very, very interested on the topic of bad sex. Now, a lot of times when you've been married for a long period of time, or even sometimes couples that are, um, they're in the relationship, they have the ideal, um, partner, but in the bedroom, things kind of go a little blah, blah. And, you know, everything else about them is wonderful. And it's that one thing um, when they become intimate with one another, they, you know, either um, what, what, usually it's one person in the, in that relationship that doesn't feel the spark or it just feel doesn't, it doesn't meet up to their expectations. So I have a lot of people in the audience want to know, what do you do when you love somebody or you're in a relationship and the person is wonderful, but you experience bad sex well there's there's a lot of ways you can get to that place and so it kind of depends on on how you got there i mean um maybe start at the most sort of severe and first sometimes one of the biggest barriers for sex is people something happens to hurt one of them or somebody feels sort of damaged and then they Kind of put up some walls mm -hmm. and one of the things really good sex is you need to be able to open up and be vulnerable with your partner if you're not in a place where you can do that um that kind of is an interference with with sex okay 
Um, and so that, in, in that case, if that's the situation, you really ought to do some healing for the, the hurt that has happened and kind of build up trust again. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, I mean, you sort of get, this sounds, this sounds kind of bad, but you kind of get out of the habit, right? right. When people get together, they get busy, they've got kids, they've got work, they've got, right? right? It's yes. Like, it's like um, connection in the relationship gets pushed further and further and further down. And, um, and then it's kind of like you, you, you feel like a business partner, right? You right. Feel like you're running successful venture together mm -hmm. well, hopefully you feel like it's a successful venture that you're running together right yeah but, um, there's not you know I mean most people don't get turned on by their business partners right right and so it's you really need to you really need to um create space for a couple and create space for you as a couple people may say um i worry with people we, we spend time together all the time yeah but what are you doing right you're talking about what you're going to do with your kids you're talking about right you need to yes. um and so people talk about the spark right so there is the spark you can you can try stuff you can try new things sexually you can be experimental you can you can do all that but i think you need to <clears throat> really also expand that spark beyond just thinking about even the erotic right but it's like right? talk about talk about other stuff that's interesting right you know yeah. you have ideas think about stuff make your make yourself a bigger person than just this small world that we've created for each other and that that kind of helps with with keeping that as well now um, I, mean, I don't know if I'm talking too much on this one. No, but, not at so, all. Because this is like a big it's topic. Also, <laughs> it's also important to be able to talk about right. sex. People get uncomfortable. I mean, it's interesting, right? A lot of times when people come in for couples therapy, the code word is, well, we have intimacy problems. <laughs> right? So do you have intimacy problems or do you have problems with sex? Ah, right. sex. Well, yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> because the, like it, it, it sort of out there and smacks you in the face and people are uncomfortable with that. But intimacy is much bigger than that. Right. Right. I mean, intimacy is affection that you do. That's non-sexual. It's about emotional sharing with each other. It's about all that other stuff. And our society doesn't always we're, we're a little bit crazy about sex sometimes, right? We're I agree. Good, bad, and you need to be able to to talk directly. And so share what you want, talk about um, what's good. I mean, oftentimes um, it's, you, you, you know, if you, if you back up and say, let's, instead of let's have sex, because that, because, which is another thing I'll talk about in just a second, right? It becomes very serious for people, right? Right. Let's back up a little. Let's schedule some time and let's play and have fun. Right. right? It should be something that's enjoyable. Um, so shut me up when I go too long, right? Uh, <laughs> um, no, you're good. The other, I mean, because another piece that often happens is it does become serious and people have very um, kind of rigid ideas about what sex is. And yeah. as couples get older, I don't know what the age group of your, you, right. But as couples get older, sometimes men find it's harder to have an erection. And that's a big um, problem also. Yeah. And, and that's natural. Right. And then it's right. like, well, they get nervous. I mean, you have a little bit of trouble. Everybody has some trouble sometimes, and then you get anxious about it, and then you have a lot of trouble. Right. But a lot of people, a lot of people, define sex as intercourse. Mm -hmm. Right. right. And, um, there is a whole lot more you can add to your sexual repertoire besides intercourse. Right. And if you want to get pregnant, you need to have intercourse. Right. Okay. Most mm -hmm. people aren't want I, that's not the goal of most sex it is a goal in some right um, but the x people and keeps you together and so it's useful to sort of expand that and play around with with all sorts of other things and um 
there. I'll st I'll, I'll I'll stop with that for now on my sort of sex soap soapbox. <laughs> Well, no, that actually, you know, I, I thought it was really funny how, you know, first of all, you made some really good pointers. First, you talked about communication is key, you know, right. and then you talked about how it's, you know, that people, you know, people kind of get kind of, they look at the media and they look at TV and they, they see, you know, you read Fifty Shades of Grey and people get this, this, this looted, you know, version of what sex really is and what, 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 you know, what, what happens behind closed doors and people, you know, your dreams and your desires are never going to meet up to your true reality, you know, and it's, it's about two people spending intimacy, spending time together, you know, behind closed doors and enjoying themselves and making each other happy well yeah i mean you bring up something else that that is probably a factor is that sex as portrayed in the media is pretty unrealistic and we're not just talking about porn here right i mean right. it's like you touch someone and they're turned on and nobody ever bumps heads or you know nothing awkward happens and people are turned on and you're having intercourse within moments and and the reality is doesn't work that way so i mean right. some people could use a uh, a whole lot of education about sex and in particular women's sexual response right it, it yes. is more complicated for women than it is for men and um it's useful to the more you know the better the better it is and that was a big factor that I heard from a lot of women that, you know, that their partner doesn't realize, you know, that it takes them a lot longer to get aroused and it's harder for them to feel aroused. And, right. you know, for a man, it, it's a lot quicker and, you know, the frustration would come in. And also, I think you made a great point also is that when you become, when you, you know, when children come into play and your life changes, you know, um, everything changes, you know, uh, you know, you got the knocking on the door, mommy, 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 or you got, you know, you got, you know, you're tired and tiredness plays a big role too, because it's very hard to have an erection or it's very hard for a woman to get to that arousal point when you're tired from a long day, you know, or a long week of responsibilities. Yeah. And, and, I think that even plays into something else, particularly when people get busy is, you know, early on in relationships, sex is usually very spontaneous. Right. It, or you, you think it, people say it's spontaneous, but the reality is when a couple first starts dating and having sex, if they're not living together, yeah. it's not spontaneous. They have sex whenever they're getting together. It's yes. <laughs> <laughs> they think it's spontaneous, but it's not really. It yeah. Happens. We have a date sex it's part of it you know um but then even early in relationships when people start living together but then when you have kids that i mean kids is the thing that changes it the the most for people in my yeah. sense right when they um people don't tell the story of how they feel like their sex life died that's oftentimes the aspect of it that that that, that seems prominent right and so you need to schedule it sometimes. I mean, you need to consciously say we're creating space, we're creating time when we can be when we can be sexual with each other, when we can get naked and play and not worry about scarring our children for life. I'm not sure it scars your children for life. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't think any any uh, child or any and you know wants to even imagine even as a grown-up you don't want to imagine your parents actually you know doing the wild thing <laughs> but you, you gotta face it i mean we all exist so it happens yeah. sometime right right exactly <laughs> exactly i'm sure my, i have a sister so my parents had tw had sex exactly twice in their lives i'm sure of that <laughs> <laughs> So I think it's probably good to have a little me time or a date night or, you know, go maybe having a short vacation. It doesn't have to be anywhere expensive, just somewhere maybe where you can get away for a day or two or a weekend. And, you know, if you're able to, you know, and, and spend some alone time or maybe, you know, the grandparents or somebody takes care of the kids that one night, you know. The, the, that That's true. Yeah. The date night, the, that you need to create the space. I guess another thing that can really help is, um, is to focus on keeping the the passion alive even when you can't be passionate, right? Right. And so there's 
there's people when it's like um unless you're in a place where you can have sex don't kiss me that way right right well, why not right i mean there's a i don't remember the guy's name it was a sex therapist out of new, new york who calls it simmering right yeah so you know why don't you do a nice passionate kiss as you're on the way out the door going to work right right it it, it so you you get a little bit you're a little disappointed what well that kind of keeps things a little bit hot yeah right? no it does so it, it's like um and, and don't worry about it you're supposed to embarrass your kids with those things right mm -hmm. you're actually modeling you know ooh, gross that <laughs> which you're then... actually mo modeling the way you ought to be in a relationship for them so i yeah, agree gross I'll appreciate it later <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I've known couples that, you know, have said they've never seen their parents kiss and then they had trouble expressing emotion because they never saw it in their household, you know, because it was kept so confined. If, you know, if they did even have, you know, romantic intimacy, you know, they never saw it. So then it, you know, when they grew up, they didn't know how to express themselves because they, ha like you said, they had no role model. Right. And that's a, it's a good thing to teach our kids, even if it makes them uncomfortable. Right. I think, you know, um, it, yeah, a big thing is that, you know, a lot of times I think um, women, you know, some women, it depends on the person because some women like the romance, some women, you know, like to get down and dirty. So, you know, everyone has their own preference, but I think it, it's understanding your partner and respecting what they want. That plays a big role is that, like you said, it goes back to communication, what that partner likes and dislikes, and then being respectful and honoring that. Right. And maybe be uh, be open to being experimental sometimes. If you like exactly. romance, well, dirty sometime. Or if you like it down and dirty, let's plan a romantic evening. I mean, there's there's a whole there's a whole menu out there. You don't have to just just eat one thing. Right. Exactly. Very well put. And, you know, for erectile dysfunction, that was a big thing that a lot of people have discussed and have come on my website even to read articles that we had published, you know, because so many people, you know, men, you know, uh, get embarrassed that, you know, they go through it. But it's so common and, and you know, it's, it's something that happens as, as you get older and, you know, the circulation of the blood flow and, you know, and, and it's, a, it's just, a, you know, your, your chemistry changes, your body changes as you get older and it's very common common and you know they like sometimes i think men find it a weakness in their manliness but it's actually something that most men experience at some point in their lives well yes absolutely i mean the reality is if you live long enough um and you you're going to experience it almost certainly at some point um and a lot of times i mean there's there's situations that men will experiences difficulty with an erection at some point even at a much earlier point in their life for whatever reason right i mean it may just be they're sick and tired that day and it doesn't and it doesn't work but it's, it's like all it takes sometimes is one quote failure and then they're like worry about it all the time which is yes. the main thing that drives erectile dysfunction but i think so you know, when we were talking about women's sexual response, I mean, you know, there is a good portion of women who physiologically can't have an orgasm from intercourse. Yes, that is a big problem. So, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if the um, sexual sign of manhood was more your ability to be able to explore sex other ways rather than have an erection because the erection doesn't do that much i mean right I, I think women appreciate that and but it's it's not the thing that that most easily creates a um an orgasm or the the ultimate sexual experience even for those people that it does work for and so it's like it's unfortunate that um so many men feel like difficulty in that area reflect poorly on their manhood. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, a good point that you brought up is, is that, you know, there, there is more to sex than, than just having an erection and having intercourse. You know, um, you know, sometimes a woman will get frustrated, but they have to realize that, you know, 
there is much more out there than just that's just a small portion of you know of the intimacy and and the sexual relationship between a partner and they you really have to have a combination of everything you know and like you said you know people don't realize it but stress you know you take home your work with you and you're stressed or you have a, a stressful week that could interfere with having an erection and then you know there are ways i guess that people can learn how to release that stress and then they could actually have an erection and enjoy, you know, that portion of their sexual relationship with their partner. Right. And if you have a regular sex life, that actually helps you manage your stress. What do you think a healthy sex life is? And, you know, what do you recommend to your partners when it comes to intimacy or sex? You know, I, I, I hate to say numbers because I mean there really there really are differences. I mean some people want to have sex um, daily. Um, some people are fine a couple of times a month. I mean, and and the the real issue is um, the couple where that desire exactly matches up is rare. Mm -hmm. and, um, it it's. <sighs> I, I I don't really have a recommendation for numbers. I I I don't right. like to get into that, right, but um, I I think that both partners should have the experience that um, they're wanted and their partner is is responsive to them. And mm -hmm. if you really never want sex, it's, as long as it's not painful or uncomfortable in some way and if it is you should probably have some looking into it you know you should probably have it sometimes and so i would say a, a healthy sex life is you feel good about it and you don't feel rejected and if that's right. we have twice a month if that's we have sex right if that's we're having it four or five times a week that's fine and i i'm not big on numbers right right People are very um, I think and, that's the point. And, and even, I mean, that that whole business and parenting and stuff interfering with sex is real, right? And so yes. I think I think you could have it. You can have a couple who may be frustrated that they're not having enough sex, but they right. have a healthy sex because it's really driven by all of that external stuff. And when they're able to create the space that they need for that, they can have great sex, right? They may right. be frustrated with the fact that it's not more. That way I would say is a healthy sex life. It's not as great as they would like, but it's healthy because right. it's, it's a thing that pulls them together rather than a thing that pushes them apart. And I think I think that's a good point because realistically, people have to realize that they're not in their early twenties anymore, and they're not, you know, single anymore. For the for the audience that we're speaking about, they're married and they have children, and life changes. And you know, at, at you know, and as they get older, those children will move out of the house. But for for a good decade, I would say at least seven years, you're going to have kids running around the house, knocking on the door, you know, requesting a lot of things from you, you know, energy, you know, stress, all these things are going to play a part of parenting. And it's, you know, it, it will, it will, uh, you know, affect your sex life to some degree. But like you said, plan a, a you know, resourceful way of spending some me time with your, with your partner. But if the last 10 times you've gone to bag together and you've looked at each other and said sex or sleep and you both said sleep, maybe it's <laughs> time to plan the other way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Definitely. I think my husband and I always made sure we had at least one vacation by ourselves. And, you know, we, we were lucky because the grandparents lived, you know, both grandparents lived nearby us. So we were able to, you know, be able to go away, but we always made sure that we'd actually have like one week out of the year where we took a vacation by ourselves and we did not feel guilty. Cause I think a lot of parents feel guilty leaving the children with the grandparents or, you know, taking that time away. Right. Well, and, and it, yeah, it, it's nice to have those resources and have grandparents. You can do that. And most grandparents are like, Hey, do it more. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I think the kids i mean it's great to support your kids relationship with your grandparents too so 
Um, not everybody has those resources. So no. Challenging. I mean, one of the few things I always ask couples, particularly with families, like, you know, where's your family who lives around? What's your relationship with them like? Because the social support a couple has or doesn't have makes a lot of difference in a lot of aspects of their life, including their sex life. Right. I agree. And, you know, I, I think the one thing people have to realize is they're having problems. They should reach out for help because a lot, like you said, a lot of people are embarrassed, you know, about talking about sex. They use the word intimacy, like you mentioned, right. but you know, I think it's a, I think it's a good thing if you can actually reach out and get that help. Well, yeah. And, and, and it's, I mean, I think the, the media can play into that sometimes too, right? It's like, people think it's something that you're just supposed to know. Well, how are you just supposed to know? I mean, there's a lot you can learn about sex. There's a right. lot of skills. There's a lot. And so um, it, it, that's great. Do that. It's not, it's not something that, you know, something's genetically wrong with you and your sex program didn't get run. No, it doesn't happen. It's a learned thing for us. We have a sex drive. Yes. Yeah. Um, act of sex and being sexual and having a relationship with another person around that there's lots you can learn about that and so that's useful that's a useful attitude to take into it now what made you so interested to go in this direction to help other couples and to help people with relationships good question i <laughs> i I'll, I'll give you my my sense of it, right? I mean, I, I've been interested in um, relationships for a long time. And when I started graduates, so first of all, I got married late, right? Mm -hmm. I was single most of my life. I was 46 when I got married. And okay. So, and my wife's 43. We had a blast. It was like all of our friends at the at the party. It's like, wow, you know, the band is awesome. This is our music. And so, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, okay. Um, we had a DJ, but um, I, I I guess I had always been interested in in relationships, and perhaps part of it was simply because I, you know, got anxious and struggled in it, and so on a lot for myself. And, right. Um, but I also got interested in psychology. I got interested in sort of systems theory, which is more about what happens between people than what happens inside people, right? Right. It, it, it kind of tickled my intellectual curiosity as well as um, having a personal, you know, aspect to that. And um, so I, I really started off my career working primarily with families and it was much more child focused. And I ran a team at a community mental health center for that, but I, I was interested in couples and developed that more and more. And then when I went in my own practice, I went that direction. And so I don't know if that really answers the question, but yeah, it was a, a part of it was a, was a, um, you know, a personal quest and part of it yeah. was tickled my, my intellectual curiosity. Um, I'm, I'm very, I'm actually really glad I got married late. I think if I had married somebody in my twenties, it would not have been quite the quality relationship that it right. is because I had a lot to learn, but yeah. I admire people who, um, who pair up and make a commitment early and then go through some of the struggles and learning together because that works well as well. So, yeah, I actually met my husband in English class. I was in college. I took a, a yeah. summer course. Yeah. And, uh, that's where I met my husband. So I've been with him for like about 30 years now. Yeah. So it's definitely a lot to learn. Like you said, when you, when you get into a relationship at an early age, and I think some people, I think go through that midlife crisis as well. When they, when they marry so young, some people have regrets that they didn't do this or they didn't do that. But then, you know, do you find that in your, in your uh, practice with some people? I don't occasionally I don't find a lot of people expressing that directly of course a lot of people may be feeling that that aren't because they're not wanting to say right you know is their partners their partner their partner's going to hear uh, okay that. yeah not particularly satisfied is coming out and so I think um I think some people feel that way but I mean regrets an interesting thing right I mean yeah you you um 
what I've told people, um, and it was interesting. I had a session just a couple of weeks ago with somebody who really dug into regret. And it's like, if you really think about regret, regret is sometimes a defensive posture because you're sad about something that's going on in your life. So then you fantasize about making a different choice and how that would have gone differently. But the right. reality is we never know what the, to what the outcome is of those different choices. And so no. it's, it's good to kind of lean in and dig into the choices that we've made and, 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 and make the best of them. Right. It's like the old Cheryl Crow song, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not it's not getting what you want it's liking what you got yeah exactly <laughs> right? and and um i mean I, there's you know everybody has points in their life when you look back and say i wonder how this would have changed if i had made this different choice at that point right right but then mm -hmm. i think if you really get caught up in that it's also useful to look at the things in your life that you're really happy about that probably wouldn't have happened had you made that choice yes Maybe always there as well nobody ever thinks about those so. no and that's an excellent point because we always think about i wish i wish i want i want you know right. and we don't think about what we actually have and like you said we wouldn't have had those things if we weren't put in the environment and in the life we currently have right yeah that's a very good point now, I think a big problem is also that a lot of times couples are afraid to tell the other couple because the other person, because they're afraid to hurt their feelings. Yeah. And so how do you go about, you know, telling the other person, well, I'm not really satisfied. You know, I don't feel that spark anymore. I love you, but I just don't feel that that spark like we did, you know, you know, how does a person go about like expressing themselves without hurting the other person? you know, and not get into a fight or not making the situation worse? Well, first you have to just accept that sometimes you can't say things without hurting the other person. Right. I mean, people, if you're in a relationship and you care about people, you're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's much better to figure out how to do that and how to communicate about things in a respectful way that keeps you connected than it is to avoid hurting each other. Cause it's actually, you're right. Avoiding hurting each other is a lot of what kind of drives the lack of communication or the miscommunication yes. makes things go wrong. Right. And so um, one of the, the, the best things, one of the best things that I, I talk to people about is you, you really, if you're talking about something that you are dissatisfied with, right, you, mm -hmm. you need to personalize it. And people say, well, you also be personal. Well, actually, yeah, you do, right? You make it about me. It's about me, my feelings, and my preferences rather than about this is the right way to do things. That's one way to start it, right? Right. But people may get hurt feelings and so on, but if you can lead with it from your um this is about what I want rather than this is about what you're not doing right. Right. You may be saying almost exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. but it's much easier to hear. Uh, um, an example I give people is when I was in graduate school, I had, I had roommates, right. I had a couple, right. a couple of different roommates at different times. And two of them liked to have people take your shoes off when you come into the house. Right. Mm -hmm. so not a big deal. Right. And one of them told me, this is the right way to do things. So take your shoes off when you come in the house. And I'm like, whatever, mm -hmm. right? And right. the other one was like, I really prefer it if you do this. And I would like it if you do that. Fine, no big deal. I can take my shoes off, come into the house, right? Yeah. But it's that, it's that. It was personalized. Oh, and I care about you and the relationship. I'm going to be much more responsive to it. Right. That's, that's a very low investment sort of story about it. But that's kind of the idea. If I care about you and your request to me is about you personally and your experience, it's much more easier for me to be responsive to that than if it's about, hey, you're kind of you're kind of kind of dropping the ball here, dude. Right. Exactly. That's a um, good point. But that attitude is something that um often takes some some effort to to cultivate right 
I see a lot of times people don't think before they talk. So they really should, you know, if they want a productive relationship, if they want a happy relationship, if they want that good sex and they want that, you know, that, that relationship that, you know, they desire to have, you really need to learn how to communicate well with your partner and say things, I guess, according to what's going to work best with your partner. Yes, you do. But you also need to recognize that we're all human and are going to screw that up at times. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's good to give each other the benefit of the doubt. When That's true. Hurt, to, to assume that it was not your partner's intention to hurt you. Yeah. But that they, that something else came. And so one of the things I say to people, and, and it, it, it is pretty true, I think, is, um, People come in and they want communication skills, right? And yes. what they really say is, I want to learn how to say the right thing all the time so that we never have problems. We never have miscommunication. We never have miscommunication. <laughs> Nobody's feeling never hurt, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. like, Good luck. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> have you ever read a legal document? Uh-huh. That's what language looks like when you try to avoid misunderstanding and then it gets so confusing that it's total misunderstanding, right? Exactly. So so what I uh, what what's often true is having kind of repair and recovery skills is all right. more important than having good communication skills, right? Because yes. we're all impulsive. We all say stuff without thinking sometimes. Oh yeah. We sometimes are very thoughtful and say something and the interpretation comes very different and it's really hurtful, right? And so yes. all of that happens. And so to be able to, um, to, to, to repair from that, to slow it down, say, okay, I'm a little bit calmer now. Let me think through it. Let me hear you. Let me understand how you took what I said. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, if right. I had heard that, I would be hurt too. Here's what my intention is. And if you can, if you trust each wow. other, give each other the benefit of the doubt and have that expectation, then you can have those conversations and get back on track. And I think rep repair is... Um, is an undervalued skill for most people because they want to avoid it, right? Yes. Nobody really wants to have to fix stuff, but you have yes. to fix because that, the other things happen. That's a very good point. You know, sometimes we, when we do say things, even if we think we're saying the right thing and, it, and our, our partner misinterprets it and their feelings get hurt, maybe wait a little bit and then go, this is what I meant. And I guess, it's good to say, you know, to be able to be man up to your, your wrong and say, I'm sorry if you took it the wrong way. I was just trying to, you know, try to, I'm try, trying to get X, Y, and Z across. Well, and, and often it's even, it's better to even, to, to start kind of, if, if, if you know your partner's hurt, right? Right. It's, yeah. it's, they're, they're going to be able to accept your, alternative meaning if they feel like you understand what their experience was right and so right. Oftentimes it's easy it's best to even just start with hey something went something went awry here my mm -hmm. intention was not to hurt you but i did can you tell me what you experienced right okay then they can say well you said blah 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 and blah 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 i meant this and and then you're like oh holy crap yeah that makes sense if you had heard that i would be hurt too i'm really sorry right. that was your experience let me tell you what i was intending to do and we can talk maybe if there's ways i could use diff language differently in the future and so on right but it's like um it's it's much easier for people to hear us when they feel understood by us yes definitely now, when you see things like if you, you're you seeing things go towards an argument or a dispute between your partner, is it best to try to back away and give each other some time alone? Like how do you, if you're, if you're starting to disagree about something, even, even you know, on the topic of bad sex or anything in the relationship, right. when you see things going the wrong way and it's just going to get worse, how do you stop it and then fix that so it doesn't go any further? Um, well, it, yeah, it, 
it's not so much about stop the argument. It's like stop the argument escalating. If you're yes. arguing, fine, you're listening to each other, you're hearing each other, you're being respectful, go for it, right? Right. What you really need to monitor, I mean, it's really about our, our nervous system, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your nervous system gets escalated and then- 100%. It, it runs you, right? The wrong part of your brain starts running your mouth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so what i tell couples is like there's i call it the rule that every couple should have right and that is and i say there's a two-part rule it's two parts to the rule and in most couples there's one person that likes the first part and then and the other person likes the second part but, but they get right. it and so the first part of the rule is you should be able to end the conversation anytime you want right Okay. And the idea of that is when I rec the, the best way it works, right, is when mm -hmm. I recognize that I'm getting close to the line that I'm going to cross, that I'm not going to be doing well in this argument. I say, <laughs> hold on, time out. I need a break. Now, you That's can also idea. do it. It's, it's also perfectly legitimate if you start being, if your partner starts attacking you and calling you names and yelling or whatnot, I have to say, look, let's take a break and do this. But it's best if I monitor myself, right? Right. And get to the point to where you're good enough to monitor it before it crosses that line. Okay. That's part one. Part two is if you end a conversation, it is your responsibility to bring it back up again mm -hmm. as soon as you are able to have that conversation. Right. Very good idea. Mm -hmm. right? And and it's oftentimes I say, I should be able to end a conversation at any time I want. And one person looks at the other. Yeah, see, see. And then I say, <laughs> God, if you end it, you have to break it up. The other one goes, yeah, see, see. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I um, have a, a question for you now. If, if, a, if you know, I've, I've had this question asked, um, you know, many times, you know, uh, people who have responded to the articles that we've written on the complete herbal guide and yeah. it young couples who find their ultimate partner and they have, they have all the characteristics and qualities that they want in a person, but yet when in the bedroom, it's, they don't feel compatible to one another. They're not in one person is not enjoying it. The other person may be, but the other person doesn't feel that spark. Can you fix that? Or is that something that probably you probably are best to walk away from? My bias is I think you can fix that most of the time. Right? Okay. Because sex is a very like I said, it's really a skills-based learning thing. There's right. Learn, right. And so if, if, um, if they just sort of start paying attention to each other, can talk directly about it, can give feedback about what feels good and so on, then the sex piece can work. Now, yes. there are people who, there are sometimes emotional blocks to that as well. That's not about the, um, mechanics of it yeah mm -hmm. like and and the reality is some people are <laughs> some people have much better sex with people they don't care about okay right yeah because when you really care about someone then as you're going in the the the, the stakes are higher mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, it's like, I, I, I worry more about it. So I'm protective and you're a little bit withdrawn, then the sex isn't as good. Right. And so if that's the P that could also be a piece of what's happening in that situation that you're talking about. And then right. That, that person really ought to do some work on figuring out how to, how to learn to be vulnerable. Cause it's a, it's a fear of being hurt. Right. Right. Yes. You, I don't care about you're hot, but man. yeah no desire to be in a relationship with you. Right. Awesome. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I can let myself loose. Doesn't matter. I don't care what you think about me. Right. But right. As, soon as it becomes high stakes, it can become much more tense. Right. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Cause sometimes people think that you get fixated on, on their eyes or body part or their smile. And right. then it's like, then they, they think, you know, they think that's, you know, oh, I'm so compatible to that person. I want them. And then they, they, it ha they have, you know, and they get to know the person. They actually like the person and, you know, and the, but then, you know, like we were mentioning, 
you know, they actually have a, a sexual experience with one another and one doesn't feel that spark that they thought maybe their expectations were too high or maybe they're just you know getting caught up again with that media and what the media stigmatizes about relationships yeah i'm glad you said that because i was i was going to say that too right because it is not uncommon that first sexual experiences aren't awesome right Mm -hmm. that's very true because you're awkward there's anxiety about it um you don't know each other you don't understand what works for each other i mean a a really good sexual relationship involves two people learning each other and right that right now if you had to give a couple of pointers and a couple of tips to people about how to improve bad sex what would you what would some of you know constructive tips you would give those individuals um so one would be get comfortable with talking about what you're experiencing, what you want and what feels good and listening to that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if you, um, so, so that would be one. And if you, if you do that, that, that opens up the, the avenue to do a lot of things. Right. Right. Um, let me give you three, right. The second okay. Three, um, don't take it so seriously. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be fun. Right. And it is difficult for fun and serious to get, to go together sometimes. Yes, definitely. Right? And, and I mean, and the reality is it is serious. It's an important piece of it, but it's, it's, it's kind of serious. Like kids need to play for their good development is serious. Right. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the final one would be if, if, is that if you find yourself kind of tightening up inside the thing we were just talking about, right. Yeah. That, Mm -hmm. That kind of is getting in the way of either of those first two things, get some help to figure out what that's about. Right. Because, um, preparing yourself to be open and and to totally lean into the sex piece is is just as important if not more important than sort of the skills and the communication that you need to learn and also what tips would you give somebody if they were experiencing erectile dysfunction or even if a female was not reaching her expectations of of experience and orgasm so what what tips would you give them if they are you know they they want to experience a, you know a good a good moment with their partner but there are things that are interfering from them reaching the heightened you know moments of of uh, intercourse and sex. For, probably is a similar thing for both, but one of the things I uh, ask almost all couples who are having erectile dysfunction is 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 to set aside some sex time right but make Mm -hmm. it sex play and take intercourse off the table right okay explore each other touch each other explore new things give each other feedback about what feels good um and don't i mean if you want to play to orgasm that's fine um and i think that that Taking away the the pressure for having an uh, uh, an erection sort of helps men then be able to lean into that. Right. That kind of play thing can be helpful for women because what it really is is it's a it's a prescription to experiment. Right. Mm-hmm. Let's play around. Let's do different stuff. And if you're giving feedback around that, hopefully you can find some more ways to experience pleasure. Very good point. Very good point. Now. I, I want to learn more about the book that you have out now. Now, tell tell the listeners about your book, the, the title, and what it really pertains to. It's it's called Not Lonely at the Top, right? And it's mm-hmm. really it's a it's a do I get the subtitle correct? It's it's a, <laughs> it's a relationship guide for for uh, successful singles. I think I'm missing something in there, right? But the idea is that. Um, a lot of people are pretty successful in their life, but haven't been able to translate that into relationships. Right. Yes. Many people. And so the, the, the big piece of the book is kind of, is a self-check, right? Okay. What makes you click? 
what are your strengths bringing into it, understanding how you need to function, understanding um, kind of where you got a lot of the ideas about what's right and what's wrong and, and how that oftentimes relates to your family, how to understand that other people might have that so that you can start to do some of that mingling stuff, right? Right. And, um, like some of the stuff about your own blocks about being open. So a lot of that is really examination about that, right? And then mm -hmm. it's kind of, um, how do you go out there and 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 meet people? And um, it's really pushing, um, helping people learn to be kind of direct and vulnerable at the same time early on. Um, if you want to build a relationship, it's really geared for people. It's not, it's, it's not a dating book. It's not, I want to go out and get as many dates as I can. Right. It's mm -hmm, really yeah. geared for people on how to translate that into an intimate relationship. If that's what you're looking for. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you see on date, you know, on dating sites, people are like, well, just, ju just looking for something casual. A lot of them aren't right. It's like, yeah. it's, it's much more, it's much more, um, it feels much safer to do that because if I say I'm serious, well, then it's much easier to get hurt and maybe right. I'll scare people away. Maybe you will scare people away because that's one of the messages I have also. You need to purport yourself. Yeah. So you really ought to be up front early on. I want to be in an intimate relationship. Right. If you scare somebody away, that's probably good to find out earlier rather than later. And I've seen that many times. I've I've experienced that. I've talked to people and they have told me that they basically, you know, the person that they're dating, you know, does not want commitment. They've been in, and and then the other person, I've seen relationships go on for over 10 years. And I know that the other person really wants that relationship, but they're settling for the non-committed individual because they don't think that they could actually achieve another real another positive relationship that that has right. commitment involved right and and a piece of it's also about really being conscious in moving forward right yes mm -hmm. times we we have this tendency i think to quickly rush into paired relationships yes it's like you date and you do that over time and then you try to work out whether you can do what you want but yes. I think you're much more conscious early on about um the decisions you make and how how and why you up your level of intimacy and connection each time right that things work a whole lot better yeah um, and so you know I, I i encourage people to to date multiple people early on right and um don't be so fast to move into one person because if you're dating three people that you know are interesting to you in different ways um there's probably a lot about them that you can learn before you start sort of winnowing it down that's the thing people most yeah. resist in my thinking about things i think everybody wants to jump in quickly yes <laughs> we, we, we live in a society where everyone jumps in but if you think back to decades that's right. how it was and and it's it's stigmatized in our society that for to be the norm but not necessarily the healthiest behavior because you go back to the 1950s and and the 60s you know people met people and they were put together some some people and relationships just happened one two three and they didn't really get to know their spouses you know and well yeah and i think um yeah but but, but there's some interesting stats. I don't know that this is true because these are old statistics. I don't know that it's true anymore. And right. Marriages are overlapping. But when you look at the happiness between love marriages from love cultures like ours, right, and arranged yeah. marriages, um, and the data, I think, are 20, 30 years old. It was like um, at the beginning of the marriage, the love marriages, they're very happy, right? Yeah. The arranged marriage is not so much. But mm -hmm. the love marriages happiness line would tend to come down and the arranged marriages would go up. Oh, and really? Average, they cross somewhere between two and three years into it. Wow. Now, that's insane, right? That is, that is. But it's not really, right? Because yeah. what makes a relationship work isn't choosing the right person. It's being somebody who's capable of creating a good relationship and choosing somebody. Yes who's capable of creating a good relationship. Yes. And people from the culture that 
had arranged marriages don't assume that it's the right per- well they kind of do assume that it's the right person because if, if you're really embedded in the cultures they choose it for it, but they assume that you have to do the work to make it work right, right. And mm-hmm. so if you can embed that on top of the love marriage but that yeah. that needs to be the most important thing that you're looking for when you're trying to create an intimate relationship out of dating is this somebody Well, first of all, am I somebody who's capable of doing what needs to happen to create an intimate relationship? And then is this somebody I can do that with, that can do that with me? And that is an excellent point because it goes back to our whole discussion, if you think about it, has been based on we control our destiny. You know, it's, it's us making the right choices, changing our behaviors, working together with good communication. We really hold relationships in the palm of our hands we can make it whatever we choose but it's taking the right steps and and even retraining ourselves to do things differently yep now you have a book that's coming out in in, uh 2023 can you tell me you mentioned it earlier but can you tell us a little bit what we're going to expect in that book what that book's about that that book's about it's for people who are having trouble in their relationship and they're looking to they're looking to get help, right? Right. Kind of how do you go about doing that? So it's it's what are the qualities and skills that you look for in a therapist or counselor who's going to be good for relationship? Mm-hmm. It talks some about the contrast between thinking relationally and thinking individually and why you need to really get someone who values a relationship. Right. And, um and then there's you know, there's also the, um, it, it, you know, when you start looking for a therapist, there's all these letters and degrees and whatnot. And what does that mean? And and the reality is it doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm not supposed to tell you, I'm a psychologist. I'm supposed mm-hmm. to tell you that because of my superior training as a psychologist, we're the best and you should get a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's individual. You need to, you need to choose the person that's best for you. Right. Right. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's that. Pretty, that's 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 kind of it in a nutshell. It's really to help people make good choices to help themselves when they're having relationship problems. Now you're working on the title right now, right? You you're you're you're. It's right now. You have a title, but it's not. You're not sure if that's exactly it's working. To, it's not very sexy, you know. No, <laughs> I it's think your guide to relationship count. That's not very sexy. So I'm no. <laughs> got any. Needs a little bit more zing to it. I think a little bit more zing to it. Yeah. Yeah. But I like the theme of the book. Yeah. Now we can find that information on your website, right? Because you talk about the book on your website. Yeah, I do. I think it's, it needs to be updated actually um, a little bit. And maybe I, it doesn't have like a project. It's just sort of there and I need to, I need to set a deadline for it so that I get it done. Right. So (laughs) when do you think it's going to be ready about? Do you think, uh, are you planning a certain time frame? out um by summer 23 okay all right that's very interesting i'll be looking forward to seeing that book now what's your website where can people find you um my website's www um i key that's a i k i dash relationships.com excellent you know this has been a pleasure you have provided so much good information now is there anything else you'd like to tell the audience about yourself or about your website or any any services you provide um i think that's pretty much it i mean i i prim- primarily do um therapy services i do both in person and you know we started doing a lot of remote stuff over the past couple of years and i've been pleased to find that that works pretty much as well also. Um, so so if pe- people want to um, schedule a, a, um, a meeting with you or an appointment with you, they can go on your website to uh, schedule a, um, maybe like my a website. I like to talk to people. Mm-hmm. Um, the best thing is to kind of reach out to me and then we'll set up a meeting and talk about whether we're a good fit to work together. And okay. Set up a time to do that. And do you have a blog on your website? I do not. Okay. Do All right. Not. Um, I should, but I don't. All right. So your website consists of your services, your books. Services. There's, I do have, it's, it needs to be updated as well. I actually publish a, um, um, a print newsletter. Okay. And those, there, those articles get put up there. They're a little bit behind as well, but you can read like about 
10 years worth of articles on that on my website as well. Well, you got to make your blog and put all those articles on your blog. <laughs> sort of like my blog, but it's not really organized like a blog. <laughs> but it, your book that's out right now, can we find that on Amazon? Where can we find that your book? Yes, you can find it on Amazon. It is on Amazon. All right. That's great. Now tell everybody once again what your website is so they don't forget it. It's uh, www.aiki-relationships.com. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Mark. I had such a great time. And I think people are going to be very interested in, in you know, information because we have so many people who inquire about the topics we just spoke about. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. This has been, this has been a blast. I had a great time too. And thank you so much for coming on our show. Your thing. I uh, look forward to seeing it get out there. <laughs> you have a great day. Thanks. You too.